five years or so, the court has rendered very important judgments in the field of the independence of the judiciary, which of course are a manifestation of the challenge that the court is facing in trying to maintain coherence between itself and its interlocutors at national level. The judges themselves, which need to be fulfill the requirements of the rule of law, to be independent vis-a-vis -vis domestic political stakeholders, so as to be able to provide convention protections in a meaningful manner. There are several ways in which a case comes before the court under uh, where an allegation is made of lack of independence of the judiciary. Let me articulate two of them. One is a person, a legal or moral, moral person, domestically alleges that in a civil or criminal case, the judge that decided the case has not been independent. That is then a complaint lodged with the court under Article 6 of the Convention. The court has recently rendered very important judgments uh, on this issue, which I think uh, are worthy of recognition. There is a Portuguese Grand Chamber judgment, Ramos Nunez de Carvalho versus Portugal, which is a rather recent. All of the cite all of the judgments that I've referenced, I will send to the professor. If you want to get them, they will be with him. Ramos Nunez de Carvalho is a case about the independence of the judiciary and the requirements of judicial councils, disciplinary proceedings, the appointment of judges, fulfilling very robust requirements under the convention. It is, of course, clear that the underlying thematic issue in that kind of judgment is the attempt of the court to robustly formulate the independence prong under Article 6.1 of the convention so as to create a clear requirement that the judge in question deciding a case in a domestic court is independent. Another uh, manifestation of a case coming to the court is when a judge himself comes to the court, a judge that has been dismissed, or a judge that has been, well, dismissed because of uh, uh, issues allegedly regarding political corruption, or a judge has been dismissed because of expressive activity. So a judge can either claim under Article 8 a violation of his right to privacy, or a violation of Article 10 because of dismissal based on expressive activity. And there are two judgments, very important judgment, that I would like to mention here. One is a Ukrainian judgment, a chamber judgment, 2011, 2012, Alexander Volkov versus Ukraine, uh, dismissal of a judge where the court took a very, very strong position against that dismissal under Article 8. But a more recent judgment uh, from Hungary, a case called Baca versus Hungary, where the president of the then Supreme Court of Hungary was dismissed because of expressive activity on behalf of the judiciary. All of these judgments create uh, a plethora of instances in which the court is attempting to reformulate, to robustly uh, inject into the independence requirement uh, 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 strong protections for the judges at national level. The last point that I would make here before I stop, and I certainly will take questions, is the question of whether at some point the court might entertain the idea that judges have a self-standing independent right to bring a case under Article 6 of the Convention. In a situation where, uh, for example, as is claimed now in Poland, where there is a claim, an allegation of influence within the judiciary, would a judge be able to bring proceedings in Strasbourg based on an independent ascertainable right under Article 6 of the Convention without a dismissal having occurred, without a direct interference having occurred which would engage Article 8 and 10. This is not Strasbourg case law at the moment, but in a very interesting separate opinion by my colleague Alexander Sicilianos, the judge elected in respect of Greece, 
in a concurring opinion in the case of Baca, Judge Sicilianos mentions the idea uh, of recognizing what he terms a subjective right of judges to bring proceedings on the basis of Article 6. Um, and we will see in the future whether uh, these ideas will come to fruition. So in conclusion, the court has gone through four phases in the life of the court. Phases which I mentioned, the diplomatic phase, the judicial phase, the expansion to the east after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the age of subsidiarity, which is the current phase, and which is now entering the fifth phase, which is a phase in which the court will be faced with challenges with regard to uh, rule of law issues, and I've tried to develop the way in which the court has attempted to deal with those issues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, it was extremely thought-provoking uh, uh, presentation, and Judge Spano has uh, kindly agreed to take uh, questions. Would you like to take them in three or why by one? Whatever. I, do, I don't know, I need to find a pen. Then, if you have any questions or comments, please. Consider I, I just uh, I haven't followed the developments in the last couple of years, but the last time I was on to this, I, I remember the president at the time uh, was talking about the or the former president uh, about the, the the caseload, right? So I'm just curious what the state of the art is in terms of the reforms in relation to managing the caseload. Is it still those four countries uh, that are dominating? Have, has the court figured out a way to reduce the amount of petitions from those four countries in particular? Is, it, is there any shifts in the, in the, in the caseload, et cetera, et cetera? Thank you. Let me take those two immediately so, so, I, so I have the thread in my head. Uh, weaknesses, certainly. I mean, there is, there is a structural weakness that is, that is the caseload. Uh, we are 47 human beings of flesh and blood uh, with 270 lawyers, which is quite substantial. But with 56,000 cases, about half of which are meritorious potential chamber cases of seven, you can immediately see that the, the, the potential for the court to deal in an expedited fashion with these cases is quite difficult. And it is certainly a weakness that a court like ours, that is, that has to, in some, in some sense, has to be able to deal with an ongoing and fluid situation, has to deal with contemporary problems at national level, is taking quite a number of years sometimes to get to a resolution, uh, which often is too late to have a direct influence uh, on the situation. So that's in the internal issue. I would, however, say, and I, I, I want to be clear on this, the court does have a priority policy, which we are constantly trying to reformulate. So we have a priority. We don't deal with cases chronologically. Uh, we deal with them based on a prioritization of substance. So we have category one to seven. If a case is classified as category one, we will deal with it rather quickly, uh, and, and so forth, So they, with, with declining order of priority. So there is an ability internally to, to maximize our potential, but it's still very difficult when you have hundreds, potentially hundreds of cases, which are even category one. So that's the internal weakness. I mean, the external, the external weakness, I would say, is, is not necessarily 
a weakness of the court itself because the court is not an isolated element of the system. This, I think what we need to realize is the court will never be stronger than the stakeholders are willing to allow the court to be. The, the court is just a human institution, the strength of which is determined by the environment in which it lives. So the importance of sustained belief, the importance of sustained trust, the importance of the sustained legitimacy of the institution is crucial for it, it being able to achieve its success. And I think it's therefore important for, important for the court also to recognize at any given moment its status within the international <coughs> environment. And for those of you that have a background in international relations, I often say to new colleagues in the court, you have to, I mean, you have to realize that you are now, if you were a judge at domestic level, if you were a professor at domestic level, you have now entered a completely different environment. You need to think in a much more expansive way about the role that you are a part of. It's both a privilege, but it's also a challenge. The second question is, yes, the answer is clear. We have now since 2010, which is in the space of nine years, been in a constant phase of reforming. And uh, we now, the situation is as follows. We have 56,000 cases pending. 83% of these cases come from 10 countries. Uh, now, if I can sort of, I think I can almost say that of the 83%, probably half of them are three, four countries. The problem with dealing with those three, four is the bulk of the cases that remain from those countries are meritorious cases. So they simply need manpower. They simply need time and man hours to deal with. Now we have in the court, and the registry has done a wonderful job uh, in reforming itself in the last 10 years to try to deal with by using IT, with using filtering mechanisms, with you trying to facilitate the way in which we register complaints, the way in which we allocate <coughs> complaints. Uh, I am one of the president of the five sections, so I am in, uh, deal a lot with case management, and we have come a very long way. But still, at the end of the day, there are simply so many cases that the court can decide in any given year. And that number is, is, is a static number. What is it? Uh, we are deciding about approximately 1,200 cases in, in committees, of, in chambers of seven. We are disposing of 50, 60,000 cases a year. In, in, in judges, uh, single judges, committees of three, chambers of seven, and grand chambers of 70. But the big cases, Approximately 1,100, 1,200 years. Thank you. Any other questions? So, uh, Theresa was first, Amandine, and then the gentleman at the back. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I was just wondering, I, I think it sounds to me like you've really hit the nail on the head of the court's uh, pressing issues. Um, but I wonder to what extent, so I study judicial independence, I'm a political scientist, um, I wonder to what extent the court is also reflecting upon the question of its own judicial independence when it thinks about how to address the, the, the pressing issues of judicial independence um, itself on, on national courts. Because it seems to me that this is a real tension. You have one court that for various reasons some people might see is lacking itself in judicial independence, basically preaching how to be independent. So, and that raises some issues about some of the reforms, right? Mm -hmm. So on the question of assessing the admissibility of cases based on a single judge, or by a single judge, how, how, how is the court seeing itself trying to, or mm -hmm. can you speak to how, how the court can potentially reconcile those, those potential issues? I mean, I think, I think the answer to that is on, on several levels. The first is the election process itself. So if we begin, how does a, a person like me come to the court? I mean, I think there, uh, and Constantine knows a lot about this as well, is, is that process has gone through a dramatic change 
in the space of 10 to 15 years. I think, I think that's clear. So we've gone from a process in which states nominated a list of three, basically without any call for applications domestically, they were picked by governments, towards a system in which the Council of Europe has, through recommendations with, with changes in its internal procedures, really, I think, done quite a lot in trying to uh, 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 both mandate a process domestically where there is an open call for applications, there is a selection procedure based on merit, and so forth. It's not a perfect system, not at all. And, and I think, but we, I think in recent years we have seen some dividends of that where, you know, the, the Council of Europe has been rejecting lists because of perceived lack of independence of candidates and so forth. So that's one part. As it comes, when it comes to the judges, the incumbent judges, after election and internally, um, I think I can safely say, and, and, uh, and I am, of course, an insider. I am. I'm a, I'm an in, I mean, I'm not. I'm coming at this not purely impartial. But I think one of the reasons that this experiment, this project called the European Court of Human Rights, is still where it is, and is still such a force, even though we have problems, it's still such a magnificent tool for European human rights protection is I think the court has always been perceived as being over and above national politics. Now, in a, I mean, in a general sense, in, we don't have judges that are bribed, we don't have judges that are receiving phone calls from politicians, we don't have judges, blah, blah, and so forth and so forth. Uh, that is not to say that the court has not been accused of taking, you know, national political lives into account. Like, for example, the court has been accused of being too, you know, too open to reactions in the UK, for example. But, but that's more sort of a geopolitical type of reaction. But when it comes to independence of the individual judge, my assessment is that is not part of... Uh, uh, if, if the court has any legitimacy problem, I don't think it is that problem. I don't think the problem is that the judges are not independent. However, we must always realize that there are cases in the court where uh, political issues come to the fore. For example, interstate cases. Cases in which the court is dealing with incredibly sensitive issues which go to the core of national political life. In those cases, the role and the situation of the national judge is very difficult. I don't envy my colleagues mm -hmm. from states where uh, uh, they are national judges. In cases, for example, where there, ha where there has been war and strife, and they have even been affected, or their relatives. Uh, I come from a country with no army, and a country which, I mean, you can come and invade us, and we'll just clap you, you come in, and everybody's happy. So <laughs> I, don't have any, I don't have any experience, and I will not have any experience with that. Having said that, and now I'm, I'm saying this very clearly, my view is, in my five years at the court, I have always been amazed at the way in which my colleagues from these states have handled themselves, have dealt with these cases. They are, of course, in a very difficult situation, but I do not accept that they can be accused of lack of independence uh, because they are certainly independent in the sense of being independent from their governments, whether they are completely unbiased as regards the assessment of facts and the law is, of course, always a question because they simply know the facts better than us and they have maybe even lived them. So my answer is I, I don't think uh, that the issue of the independence of the court itself is, is, is one of the big problems we're dealing with. But there I may be wrong and there may be different, different perceptions on the outside. 
Thank you. Let's hope that nobody who watches this tape uh, will have an idea of invading Iceland. Uh, <laughs> then at least partially it will be your fault. Uh, Amandine? Um, thank you very much for your talk. I greatly enjoyed it. Um, my question is the one you, I think, invited at the very beginning of your lecture when you said you would come back to this notion of stakeholder. Yeah. And I would actually like to hear about what you mean by stakeholders, because from your talk, we clearly understand national authorities, judicial uh, courts, and so on and so forth would be sta yes. obvious yes. stakeholders. Yes. But what about civil society? Absolutely. What about obvious Absolutely. stakeholders? Absolutely. Thank, for, for, thank you for reminding me of that. Of course, uh, uh, my concept of a stakeholder is a broad one. A stakeholder is every actor in the convention system which has a stake in the outcome of proceedings either which they are directly involved in or indirectly. So we're talking about the applicant himself, we are talking definitely about civil society, non-governmental organizations, and one of the ways in which the court has been trying to incentivize civil society and non-governmental organizations in uh, uh, it identifying and articulating their views about the court is one, uh, increased third-party interventions in the work of the court, which has grown exponentially in the last five to ten years, which is a very good thing in my view. Secondly, the court is active in dialogue with the NGO community. I'll say this very clearly. We're also actively in dialogue with agents of governments. The court is... We have a very big institution. We, I mean, we have meetings with, with, to discuss the work of the court. Uh, we are involved with bar associations in dialogue meetings and so forth. About 30,000, 40,000 people come and visit the court every year. I give speeches and lectures, and all of the judges give speeches and lectures, you know, twice, three times a month. To, so my point is, that this is, I think, one can say a part of policy of the court to try to engage in a dialogue, not only through classic judicial proceedings, which is, of course, where we render our judgments, but also in colloquiums like this, and also in trying to get civil society and NGOs to take, uh, which they do, by the way, very well, uh, an active part, part in the work of the court. Thank you very much. Gentlemen at the back. Thank you ever so much uh, for a very interesting talk. Um, it, it seems to me that one of the issues that you, you, you correctly identified, I think, is, is this idea of a caseload that perhaps runs the risk of becoming a, an irreducible minimum to, to the point where the, the backload would actually impact on the uh, rendering of, of, of justice. Um, to what extent do you believe there's a scope for the court to maybe expand its approach in a way that could uh, improve those outcomes? Uh, and more generally, uh, do you feel that that risk could grow in the future? What do you mean by expanding its operations? Having two judges per, per state. Well, perhaps. I mean, I, I know that sounds, you know, that there are obviously lots of different options there in terms of perhaps expanding its Uh, I mean, in, uh, listen. I mean, that is that is that is a question of resources. If if you know, but that's that is a question for the states. The situation now is, as those of you that follow the Council of Europe, the situation is one where the Council of Europe is in the midst of a budgetary crisis because of, uh, let's say, problems with certain members of the Council of Europe, uh, which which hopefully will be resolved in the foreseeable future. So we are now actually in a state of austerity. So any idea of expanding the operations of the court, with in, which requires increased resources, is, I think, not realistic for the moment. Certainly, uh, in, uh, two judges per state, I think, is, is out of the question as things stand. Uh, but I would definitely like to see 100 more lawyers. No question. Uh, but it's all a question of resources. Uh, as I said, this is a human activity. It, it requires time and it requires manpower. 
the Dutch panel was very diplomatic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's Russia who is not paying for third year in the row, uh, to the, uh, doesn't pay their budgetary contribution to the, Europe, to the Council of Europe. And therefore, I don't know how badly it impacts the budget of the court. I don't think so. But obviously, it's a freeze of any development uh, that requires uh, uh, resources. Uh, shall we take a couple of more and then enjoy our drinks reception, which is hopefully waiting for us outside? Any other questions? Yes, please, sir. Um, so there's this Martin, Marty Koskinyemi paper that you wrote 20 years ago that I've been struggling to get out of my head for, since we've read it in the first semester. Um, in it, he sort of makes a plea for politics rather than increasing sort of specialization and other similar tools to uh, deal with fragmentation. And one of the things he particularly points out is saying that the uh, precision that we look for in domestic courts is simply not available in international courts. The court precision? Law. Precision. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they say it's simply not available. He says it's simply not available in international law and international courts. Um, that was something that I struggled to, to mm -hmm. um, make sense of as a, as a, as a re for in terms of his reasoning. I just wondered what you made of the idea of a lack of precision in international I'm law. Not, in I'm not really out. sure what, what is meant by that. Um, we need to talk to Koskini. Yeah. Yeah. If, if the idea is that uh, If the idea is that uh, international jurisdiction, international courts and organizations uh, do not speak the speak and talk the talk in a manner which is understandable, I think that is incorrect. I'm not sure, I don't want to, Marty Koskiniemi is of course famous and, and very respected, so I'm not, I don't want to, especially as I'm on tape, I don't want to, uh, <laughs> uh, but but uh, what I do think is what I do think is important, though, and I'm, I'm not I'm not answering your question, but I'm deviating a bit in a different way. What I think is important and is is crucial for uh, a court like the Strasbourg Court is that the language it adopts, the reasoning it puts puts forward, its articulation of the issues are indeed understandable. What I mean by that is, the court always needs to be current. It sounds strange as sort of court in fashion. What I mean by, the, the court needs to identify the human rights issues in a manner which the contemporary human being recognizes and understands. Now it may be in a, in a manner which is extremely progressive, that's fine. I mean. The beauties of the Strasbourg Court, in many ways, it's been ahead of its time. So I'm, I'm not saying it shouldn't be ahead of its time, but it should be sensitive to whether it is in the right place at the right time. Because, and, and that I think for those of you that deal, are dealing with, you know, more social science research, uh, international relations, and, thing, and, and, you know, more geopolitical type issues. <coughs> A court, especially an international court, cannot simply afford to live in a vacuum. And I, I mean that wholeheartedly, even though it's of course a court of law, <coughs> there is no difference between a court of law in the international arena in that particular sense, although its role is different. Its role is to define and articulate principles and decide in a disciplined manner. It's not a political body in the party political sense or the more traditional political sense. It's still part of human life and it needs to interact with its environment in a manner which is precise. So that's the way I would answer the question. All right, so Ben has uh, the right to uh, ask the last question. And, uh, I wish I had a better question. Yeah, well, a lot of pressure on you. Ben, just um, picking up um, here on the idea of the, the courts and not being understood in, in a vacuum, and also what where you alluded there to the court in, in so many ways being ahead of its time, um, 
when I think about legitimacy, so far the conversation's very much been in the context of the court vis-a-vis -vis its member states. And that makes a lot of sense for the court being a court of delegated authority. But I wonder whether you might broaden out a little bit and think of the idea of legitimacy in relation to the court more, more globally. I was wondering if you had any perception of the, the perceived legitimacy of the court at, at a global level. But more specifically, picking up on Alex's idea of fragmentation. Another way that the court is ahead of its time is in relation to the idea of regional human rights protection generally. So I wonder if you had any thoughts on um, the role that the court plays in relation to other regional mm -hmm. human rights frameworks on a global level. I, that, that's actually a great final question, if it's the final question. Uh, I'm certainly open to other questions. Uh, there are two answers that, well, two levels of that answer that I would give. The first one is I think it's clear, and I, I don't think I am over overestimating the court when I say that when it comes to other international organs in the sphere of human rights, the Inter-American Court, uh, the African Court, and so forth, even the, even the international criminal tribunals, the European Court of Human Rights is a pillar of human rights law. That's clear. I mean, we are, the, the references made to the European Court of Human Rights are found in jurisprudence all around the world. Now, what does that empirically mean? It, I, I think one has to think that the court is considered to be at the avant-garde of articulating the principles under the convention which are symmetrical to the same principle elsewhere. One can also see that in national jurisdictions, uh, non-Council of Europe states, the court is also a point of reference for national courts. Uh, the court has been referenced in the US and in many other countries. So I think the, 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 that's my first answer to the first part of your question. Now, what impact does that have on uh, <coughs> the way in which international, international human rights law develops as such? Well, I think that is a very, very complex answer. Uh, just a recent example, which, which maybe I know Constantine because he is very interested in SAS versus France. Does everybody know SAS versus France? What case that is? Burka. That's the, the Burka case from France, uh, the ban uh, in... in and there you had the European Court of Human Rights in 2013-14 uh, find that a burqa ban in France was convention compliant. It was not a violation of the convention. But more recently, as you know, the UN Human Rights Committee finds differently. Why is that? What happened there? How is that... Uh, how, what does that say about the regional system vis-a-vis, -vis, well, the, the ICCPR system is a global system. Well, yeah. Uh, I think it does say that although the court is a global player, it is also envisaged to be, to a certain extent, articulating European values. So in that sense, there are European values which are not necessarily symmetrical to global values, or if, if, there, if there is such a thing as a global, I don't think there is, but sort of other regions of the world where human rights are being developed, and vice versa. I mean, we have often cases from the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, which are referenced to us in litigation, and uh, the Inter-American Court has simply gone much further than we, were, we consider ourselves to be able to go under the European Convention. It's simply because they are living in a different environment. Uh, I, the last thing I would say is, I am a national human rights lawyer. We had this conversation, me and Constantine. I'm a national human rights lawyer. I'm not a PIL person, although I've maybe become one after five years in the Strasbourg Court. I, I don't, I don't, I'm not com absolutely comfortable with public international law because that's not my field. So I'm not particularly, I mean, when I hear fragmentation, a uh, PIL is Sort of it's, it's like, you know, watching how the horror movie, Halloween or something. <laughs> sort of the worst word. Of the... I mean, I think fragmentation of law is perhaps simply a reality. It's not necessarily the worst thing in the world. Particularly, I'm not of the view that the European Court of Human Rights 
should be in the business of wanting necessarily to adopt a solution so as to unify international law if it's to the detriment of human rights. There can be, and I can name judgments here, where we have actually had this question, whether we should adopt a standard which follows more the PIL standard, but in fact that would perhaps create a vacuum of human rights, you know, issues of jurisdiction and things of that sort. So, uh, fragment, for the national human rights lawyer, fragmentation is not such a bad word. I'm the international lawyer. <laughs> Uh, unless you have some absolutely last, very uh, crucial question, I will... No, I see... It's like know. a Finnish sauna in here. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you very much. There should be a drinks reception outside. I'm not, I'm not sure, but there should be. I should be promised. And we have a couple of uh, other... You can... Start moving. That's okay. Uh, there, uh, there are a couple of uh, other events of the units uh, this semester, so uh, I will be informing all of you about this. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.